Good evening, everyone. I'm just checking the audio levels before uh, starting the talk at about half past seven.
Hello everyone and welcome to this virtual talk. As it is unlikely we will be able to resume our normal programme in the near future, it is our intention to arrange more of these talks over the coming months. Tonight I'm pleased to welcome back Dr Julian Onions, who is lecturer and researcher in the Astronomy Department of Nottingham University. Tonight his talk is entitled The Far Side of the Moon. Is it full of aliens? Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much, Neil, for the uh, introduction. And tonight, I'd like to talk to you about the far side of the moon. And uh, as, as Neil and the title said, is it just full of aliens or is there more to it? So uh, with that, shall we get into it and see what we can find out? Hoping uh, this is all coming through OK on the audio and uh, you can all hear what I'm saying. So, far side of the moon. So the near side is really quite familiar to us. I'm sure we've all stared up at the moon at one time or another and looked at uh, the craters on it or seen the man in the moon or whatever uh, we'd like to see out there. Uh, as a picture, we'll come across and see a, a few of the images people have seen in the moon uh, a little later. So the near side is really quite... Uh, familiar to us, and we've even been there and touched it. The Apollo missions, uh, which I'll cover very briefly later on, have uh, been to various places on the near side. You can see the, the landing sites shown here. But the far side, that's more of a mystery uh, because it's always hidden from us. We've never been able to see until the dawning of the space uh, era what's on the far side. So wherever there's a mystery, there's always the chance of people coming up with strange theories and uh, wild speculations about what's going on there. So conspiracy theorists have had a, a great time with the far side of the moon because it's always been so well hidden from us that uh, we've never been able to know what's on there. So you can imagine anything that's on the far side of the moon and nobody can tell you any otherwise, at least until reasonably recently. And there have been many cases of uh, newspapers also involved in this. Here's one from, uh, this is, well, 2016. Uh, has there been a giant alien castle found on the moon by UFO experts? Um, uh, I have to say the answer is no, but, uh, you know, full marks for actually giving it a go and uh, trying to see if there is. Here is the picture in question. Uh, I'm sure you can all see that this is a, a giant alien castle and probably see all the features therein. Uh, this is a blow up of it. Uh, clearly a giant alien castle with uh, turrets and ramparts and all sorts of things. Or could just be uh, uh, sort of camera noise or uh, artifacts of the photographic process or something like that. Uh, there's all sorts of possibilities. But even going back uh, quite a few more years, uh, the Sunday Sport. I don't know how many of you remember the Sunday Sport as that uh, paradigm of uh, journalistic integrity had this headline that a uh, World War II bomber was found on the moon and uh, here is that uh, World War II bomber that was found on the moon in a very grainy photograph but luckily they had some uh, amazing technology at the time which uh, I think has now been called something more familiar like Photoshop where they managed to zoom in and enhance that and uh, here we can see the full picture, obviously, of a World War II bomber found on the moon. This one is uh, probably a US Air Force B-17. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but if you know anything about the moon, you probably know that crater is probably uh, many kilometers across. So this is actually a really huge uh, beast of a machine. Uh, other stories have it as a Lancaster bomber. Uh, all sorts of other things uh, have been discussed as ending up on the moon. Uh, all of them false, I'm uh, afraid to say. And indeed, this was followed up by the Sunday Sport saying that the World War II bomber found on the moon had vanished. So, uh, you know, that's uh, uh, not an uh, unusual part for the course. Uh, you may also remember other uh, famous headlines from this particular newspaper, such as this 
a London double-decker bus found on the South Pole and a statue of Elvis found on Mars. So uh, whilst these are probably a little into the area of speculation, it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that people have speculated on what was on the far side of the moon. Uh, there was a film about it, Transformers Dark Side of the Moon, uh, where there's a, a big colony of things on the far side of the moon, I believe. I've not seen the film, to say. Uh, but uh, you know, a fine place to hide anything at all that uh, you want hidden. And I say this goes back a long way. So this is a newspaper article from 1835, uh, perpetrated by the New York Sun, where they claimed that Sir John Herschel, famous uh, astronomer of the time, son of William Herschel, who you may or may not have heard of, uh, he was actually in the southern hemisphere mapping the southern skies, but the New York Sun decided that uh, they would publish this series of photographs that uh, his brand new telescope had uncovered and uh, the sketches therein. So you can see all these wonderful pictures of life on the moon discovered by uh, supposedly John Herschel, although he was uh, completely unaware of this. But I have to say, even today, the biggest telescopes on the um, the Earth, or even uh, in orbit, such as the Hubble Space Telescope, you would not be able to get anywhere near the resolution to be able to see uh, images of this size uh, on the Moon. So uh, it was always going to be a hoax. We'll come back to uh, discuss this a little further later when we do look at some images from the Moon. And of course, if you uh, around in the 1970s, then you obviously had to own this particular album, Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon, uh, which uh, is sort of inaccurate because the moon has a seven day, a uh, 14 day day and a 14 day night. So uh, all areas of the moon are equally part time in the dark and part time in the light. So uh, there is no dark side of the moon, something that they do acknowledge on the album. If you listen to the very, very end, just as the heartbeat fades out, you can hear Jerry O'Driscoll, uh, who was the doorman at the EMI studios, say there is no dark side of the moon, really. As a matter of fact, it's all dark. Well, that's a matter of opinion, but there we go. So uh, let's get back to a little bit of reality. So what do we know about the moon? Well, the latest theories is that it all started with a bang, that uh, the moon was created actually from the Earth. So the Earth was formed about four and a half billion years ago and uh, didn't have a moon at that point. And then a small planetoid about the size of Mars struck it. Uh, they actually called it Thea. It struck the Earth uh, a sort of glancing blow uh, that uh, is, is shown in this uh, animation here that I uh, hope you can see and uh, it's cast off uh, a great amount of material that uh, spiralled into the orbit around the Earth and uh, eventually coalesced into the Moon over many millions of years. It's still a uh, somewhat contentious theory because this, orbit, this uh, planetoid has to hit the proto-Earth at exactly the right angle, more or less, to uh, uh, get this to happen. It hits too shallow an angle, then it just sort of glances off the surface and continues off into space. If it hits it too full on, then it cracks the Earth into uh, into pieces and shatters it. So you've got to hit it at just the right angle. So that some, that's why some uh, planetary specialists still wonder about whether this is the right explanation. But it seems to be the best one we've got so far. So the next thing to ask is why do we only see the near side of the moon? And this is a phenomenal a phenomenon called tidal locking. And this is a well-known phenomenon that uh, any large body orbited by a small body can get into this situation where the smaller body gets tidally locked to the uh, larger body so that it only ever shows one face. And this occurs because uh, of, well, as you might guess from the name tidal locking, uh, we know that uh, you get tides on the Earth caused by the Moon. So the Moon pulls on the Earth and raises uh, a body of water up. Uh, so you, you get a sort of a bulge of water at this side. And equal and oppositely, you also get a bulge of water on the other side. So you get two tides a day. So we get this bulge of water that moves around the Earth as the Earth spins. 
The same thing also happens to the moon. You get a uh, force gravity of the Earth on the moon, and it attracts the nearer part of the moon more strongly than it does the further part. So it pulls it out into this um, sort of oval shape. This is gr grossly extort distorted here. In fact, this only rises up by a few meters, uh, well, maybe a few tens of meters. The surface rises up as the Earth sort of passes over. But that's enough to give it a, a small pull, and it's a differential pull. So if the moon was spinning slowly like this, you would then get sort of an asymmetric pull that would tend to uh, pull the Earth, uh, sorry, pull the moon back into uh, facing the Earth. And slowly over many millions of years, this is a sort of frictional force and slows down the rotation of the uh, moon until it's entirely just pointed at uh, the Earth. And there it will stay, because uh, if, if it started to drift the other way, it would get pulled back into uh, uh, synchrony the other way. So this is a well-known phenomenon. Uh, we thought it also happened with some planets. So Mercury being the nearest to the Sun was thought to be tidally locked to the Sun. But it turns out it's not quite. It's uh, in, a, in a two to three synchrony. So it goes round, I think, twice. So it revolves twice for every three times around the Sun. Or it could be the other way around. I can never remember. Uh, but uh, this is thought to be the case for Mercury, but uh, turns out not to be when we did better measurements. It is still most certainly true for some of the planets we've discovered around other stars, that they are locked towards their sun. And that gives you very uh, tricky circumstances for living on those planets, because one side is facing the sun, so it's always in uh, harsh sunlight, gets very, very hot. The other side is in uh, shadow all the time, so it gets very, very cold. And you, because of the heating on one side and the cold on the other, you get strong winds that go around from one side to the other. So it's not particularly conducive to life. But uh, we don't know that until we've uh, seen in more detail. Anyway, back to the moon. So the moon does still rotate. Uh, it rotates once on its axis for every once around the Earth. So every 28 days or so, it uh, spins once on its axis. And you may be able to see this in this animation, that it is actually rotating about its centre as it goes around, which keeps it always pointing one side at the, the Earth. So that's what uh, gives us this far side of the moon that we never get to see, or almost never. Because there are a few uh, anomalies to this, uh, very slight anomalies anyway. Uh, if we look at this, the Earth-Moon uh, system, the moon goes round in, a, in not a perfect circle, it is an ellipse. So at some points uh, uh, around the orbit, uh, certainly around this part of the orbit, it's, it's actually going quite a lot faster and going slower at this point in the orbit. So it goes sort of slower here and then speeds up here and then races round and slows down. Uh, well, it slows down and speeds up at various points. So if it's pointing at, uh, one side is pointing directly at the Earth at this point, uh, it can't always be pointing there because uh, of the way it slowly rotates around. So this does let us see slightly more of the moon's surface than you might expect, uh, a phenomenon called libration. And also the fact that the moon doesn't exactly spin uh, on a axis perpendicular to the Earth is, is also true. So this uh, phenomenon called libration you can see in this uh, animation done by somebody who collected lots of uh, photos over many days, you can see it's the you know, moon sort of wobbles on its axis as it progresses through these 28 days, giving them different phases. This actually allows you to see a few craters that come into view on either side of the moon. They sort of creep into view at uh, one point and then they disappear later on into uh, the moon cycle. So you can see about 60% of the moon's surface from the Earth if you're willing to watch it long enough and hard enough. And uh, this, this was actually very useful during the Apollo period because you could actually survey quite a bit more of the moon than uh, was uh, required by sending satellites there. So that's uh, 
one way you can see a little bit more of the moon. But the far side is still mostly hidden from us. A good 40% of the moon we're never going to be able to see directly from the Earth. And one of the issues you've got uh, once you get into spacefaring civilization like we are now, uh, if you want to send a satellite to the far side of the moon to pick things up, uh, is it's very difficult to communicate with it. So if you do go and land a satellite on the far side of the moon, you now can't uh, communicate with it because you've got a large hunk of rock sitting in the between you, which is called the moon. So radio waves do not go through rock, at least not that amount of rock. So you can't communicate directly with it. If you try and uh, send a signal to it, it just will never get there. So this is one of the dilemmas of the early space race uh, period. If you want to send a satellite to look at the far side, it's pretty hard going to communicate with it, uh, at least in real time. So one thing you could do is, is put a satellite right over here. So here we're putting a, a satellite somewhere near the moon, and we now have a clear line of sight over to this satellite over here, and the satellite has a clear line of sight to this um, space probe. So that is one way we could do things. Uh, that, that would actually get you to uh, be able to communicate to uh, a certain amount. I'm just seeing and getting some buffering issues, hoping it's coming through OK. But the problem with putting a satellite there is it's now in orbit around the Earth. So it doesn't go at the same speed as the moon. It goes uh, slightly slower, in fact. And so whilst it's sitting there, it doesn't sit there for too long and slowly moves away from where you've put it. So you only get a short period of time to sort of park it there before it, it disappears. So that's not a great uh, result for this. You could put it somewhere else. You could put it right here, which is quite near to the moon. But now it's in orbit around the moon and that brings its own problems. So it only uh, sees the spacecraft or uh, lander every so often and not at the same time as it can see the Earth. So you can get some communication with this, but it's a little bit more tricky because you have to uh, record what you want when it's going over the uh, space probe that's landed on the far side save it up and then transmit it back to the Earth when uh, you're on the near side. So that's a bit of an issue and uh, can give you a few problems with that. But luckily there is a, a solution to this. Uh, there is uh, some certain places between the Earth and the Moon that are kind of stable and these are called Lagrange points and there are actually five of them and uh, we can see them here. So there's uh, L1, which is a place sort of somewhere between the Earth and the Moon, where the Moon's gravity is sort of cancelling out the Earth's gravity. So they're both pulling on each other and they, they anything placed there tends to get dragged around by this combination of the uh, Earth and Moon's gravity sort of acting together. So this is a great place to put a uh, space hotel. So you put it there and it would sit there quite nicely and just wait there for passengers to come there and arrive, and they could uh, park themselves there before moving on to uh, uh, a hotel on the moon or something like that. So that's L1, that's a great place. A good place for uh, communicating uh, with other, uh, the far side is to point at this L2. This is another place where the sort of gravity of the Earth and moon also gag up. And if you put something there, it more or less stays there as well. So L2 is a great place. Uh, there's also L4 and L5, which are a certain way around the orbit. They're a bit further out than I've put them here. And places, people, um, or things that are parked there will stay there. Not particularly useful in this scenario for any particular use. And if you're wondering where L3 is, that's uh, on the other side. Uh, th this is also true of the Earth and Sun uh, uh, combination. So if you look at, uh, here we have the Sun and the Earth. This also has its own L1, L2, L3, L4 and L5. So L1 is a very favourite place for putting sun-focused telescopes uh, because they just sit there and they're always in the same place so you can always communicate with them. Uh, L2 is an, another favourite place for putting space telescopes because it's shielded from the sun somewhat uh, 
at a long way away from the Earth, about uh, one and a half million kilometres, and things stay there too. Uh, L4 and L5 have been used by for uh, Sun telescopes too because you, they, they also sit there and you can look at different aspects of the Sun. L3 we haven't found a use for. Uh, this is sort of diametrically opposite uh, the Earth on the other side of the Sun. So it's always hidden from us by the Sun. Uh, people used to think there was a planet here called Vulcan or something like that that uh, was always forever hidden from us. But uh, anyway, that's turned out not to be the truth. Let me just have a sip of water. So those are good places to get to if you want to uh, uh, put things, and we'll see those put to some use uh, fairly shortly. So let's look at our progress to seeing the far side of the uh, moon, how we managed to get there. The very first attempt to get anywhere near the moon whatsoever uh, was by the Soviets, uh, the Russians, in 1959 with Luna 1. This was the first satellite or um, space object to be launched towards the moon and get anywhere near the moon called Luna 1. And it was designed to actually hit the moon or crash into the moon, but uh, unfortunately they missed. But it got very close to the moon. So this was the first um, human built device that got anywhere near the moon called Luna 1, 1959. And they followed it up very quickly with Luna 2, 1959 also. And this was the first uh, satellite or object to actually hit the moon. So this one did collide with the moon. So this was the first object of man-made origin to actually get to the moon and touch the moon. It crashed into the moon, so it just took a few photos on the, the way down into the moon and then uh, obviously uh, uh, met its demise uh, with a small crater in the moon. So that was the first object to actually ever touch the moon, but this was on the near side. Now the first thing to see the far side of the moon was a follow-up probe called Luna 3, also from Russia. 4th of October 1959, and this did take some images of the far side. Uh, very primitive camera by today's um, digital uh, technology. But even so, a phenomenal uh, uh, breakthrough of actually getting around to the far side of the moon and taking some pictures. Very grainy, as you can see. So... Uh, not a great deal of information, but they did publish an atlas of the far side of the moon based on some of this data as a, you know, quite a coup that they got uh, to the moon and round to the far side. And they were the first people ever to see the far side of the moon, uh, the scientists back in Russia. So that was quite a coup for them. Now, the next big uh, breakthrough really was uh, another Russian probe called Zond 3. Now, this was a probe that was supposed to go to Mars and sort of did go to Mars, uh, but in a, a rather strange way. Uh, it was late in launching. They had some issues with the probe and had to delay the launch. So when it did launch, uh, it went off to Mars, except it went to where Mars was uh, or would have been. But uh, because it was a few months late launching, Mars had actually moved on in its orbit, so it got to where Mars would have been if it had launched on time, but um, Mars wasn't there when it arrived. But anyway, uh, part of its uh, mission was a fly by the moon on its way there, and it had a much better camera, so 1965, this is six years on, and we get some much better pictures of the far side. So here we can see some pictures taken of the far side. Uh, you can probably already see it's somewhat different to the near side. You can't see any of these big seas, these big maria that we see on the near side. Uh, it's, it's covered in craters, which uh, is fairly evident, but it does look quite different to the uh, near side. So that was one of the first clues that things were going to be a little different. Now, we haven't forgotten our conspiracy theorists. Some of the pictures from there did show strange objects in the uh, pictures, but you can see they're very grainy pictures and... Uh, the, the processing of these was still very much done by uh, the old uh, film in a camera type thing where you, you took a film, you developed it, uh, and then you then it was uh, scanned very much like a facsimile machine, uh, if anybody remembers those, and then that was sent back to the Earth. So there's all manner of ways that you could get strange artifacts into it. So uh, 
here we have a, a tower on the moon, obviously uh, home to aliens. Uh, next thing to actually get to the far side of the moon was, uh, well, we think it got to the far side of the moon, which I'll explain in a second, is Ranger 4. So this is one of the first of the uh, Ranger probes sent by the US. Rangers 1, 2 and 3 went to the near side. This was designed to go to the far side, so it launched in 1962. Uh, but uh, it had a computer failure very early on in its launch, just as it set off for the moon. Uh, which meant the solar panels didn't deploy and uh, it was uh, therefore ran out of power and uh, nothing more was heard from it. So for all we know, it probably ended up crashed into the far side of the moon as it was intended to, or it might have missed. Nobody knows because we lost track of it very soon after its launch. So uh, this may have been the first thing to reach the far side of the moon, but uh, until we get uh, far better tracking of things on the uh, far better data of the far side of the moon, uh, we, we just won't know. So we've no idea where to, where it landed, and the moon's a big place to, to look for something this small. So that was unfortunate. Now we're going back to uh, the Russians. Uh, they stole a march again with Luna 9. This was the first soft landing on the moon in 1966. So rather than just crashing into it, this had uh, rockets to slow it down and settle down nice and gently onto the moon, make a, a good landing, and then uh, had various scientific instruments. I think it had seismometers and other things on there that uh, could uh, analyze the, the moon and all its environment. So uh, that was the yet another uh, first for the Russians at that point. Uh, they also had uh, another first with Luna 10, in March 1966. This was the first uh, sort of permanent satellite to go into orbit around the moon. So uh, it's quite easy to get to the moon and come back, but uh, you, you need a, a reasonably powerful rocket to slow you down when you get to the moon and stay in orbit. And this the Luna 10 did, and uh, made some quite uh, significant discoveries based on its orbital parameters, and uh, had, had a few other things, interesting uh, satellite. Uh, then the next thing was the Lunar Orbiter, uh, which was uh, uh, a US mission that went back to the moon. As you can see, 1966, 1967, we're getting very close to the Apollo missions at this point. So looking for a good landing site for eventually Apollo 11, they needed very good uh, maps of the moon to pick out a suitable landing site. You want somewhere with not too many boulders, not too many craters, a nice flat plane that you could safely land on. So they sent these series of orbiters, uh, Lunar Orbiter 1 to 5 uh, in 1966 to 1967 to make a good map of the lunar surface so they could work out some good landing sites. But as these were in orbit around the moon taking these pictures, uh, which incidentally was all based on spy satellite technology. Uh, they also mapped the far side of the moon. So uh, not only do you get the near side, you get the far side for free. And you can see some of the pictures of the far side over here, including this uh, about the only sort of flattish spot on the far side, which is this, this area here. So that was uh, Lunar Orbiter uh, 1 to 5. And uh, they also contributed to uh, the uh, conspiracy theory. They found these things called uh, the Tower and the Shard, which you will perhaps see there highlighted. Uh, yet again, people poured over the photographs and found what they thought was uh, alien constructs or something like that uh, on the moon. Things that uh, NASA was clearly hiding from us. The next significant thing to get to the far side of the moon was Zond 5. You might have remembered Zond 3 was the one that took the first sort of highest resolution pictures of the far side. Well, Zond 5 was a, a same sort of a technology. This one went around the far side of the moon and then came back and actually landed back on Earth. So having been run around uh, the moon, it uh, came back. But it also had passengers. So uh, it uh, was the first thing to carry living things that were actually able to see the far side of the moon, or at least experience the far side of the moon. 
because uh, they had this tortoise or a pair of um, Russian Siberian tortoises were packed onto this probe and sent around to the far side of the moon. Also some wine flies, some mealworms, plants, seeds and bacteria were also sent uh, once around the moon and back again. By this time they were fairly sure that there was no uh, nasty hazards waiting for you on the far side of the moon, no giant aliens with uh, giant nets or something to capture you or uh, intense radiation or anything like that. But it's always as well to uh, double check these things. So having sent some living uh, animals around the far side of the moon and then landing safely back in the sea on Earth, they were able to examine them and see if they'd been affected by the uh, experience. And apart from the, the, the tortoises being a little underweight when they got back because apparently there wasn't enough lettuce packed or something like that, uh, it was all very successful. So we're now rapidly entering the, the uh, end game of the space race. So this was really the era of Apollo and they had a lot to do at this point, the US, to get back into the game. Because uh, some of you may remember or uh, may have even uh, seen, uh, there's a number of notable firsts by the Russians. So Sputnik in 1957, the first artificial satellite to uh, orbit the Earth, followed by uh, the first lunar probe that we've already seen in 1959, the first lunar contact in, also in 1959, the first spaceman, Yuri Gagarin, Vostok 1, 1961, yet another first, followed in 1963 by the face, first space woman, Valentina Tereshkova, uh, in Vostok 6. So quite a few firsts there. The first lunar soft landing, as we've heard. Uh, the first lunar satellite, Luna 10. So they've got all these firsts. Um, they also had the first spacewalk and uh, also the first animal in uh, space with Laika the dog. So up to now, um, you know, if you're looking at the Guinness Book of Space Records, uh, Russia is then there as having all of them basically at this point. The, uh, the Americans are really struggling. So they got to do something big to catch up, which was why John Kennedy proposed this race to the moon. And uh, Indeed, as we all know, that, that did happen. So this brings on the era of the Apollo missions. Uh, I'm not going to spend too long on these, but I'm going to go through a few of them. Unfortunately, it all starts with a rather tragic occurrence. Uh, the Apollo 1 plugs out test on the launch pad with Grissom, Chaffee and White uh, within sitting in the capsule doing a a test run of the capsule um, abilities and uh, pressurization and things like that. Uh, this was never designed to launch or anything, this is just a practice run. But unfortunately, as you may or may not remember, they had a, a drastic fire in the capsule all of a sudden, uh, caused by an electrical fault. And uh, quite, well, obviously very tragic because the three of them died on the launch pad very quickly uh, in this blazing inferno. Uh, a lot of the equipment within the capsule was quite fire retardant, but this particular test was done under uh, a pure oxygen atmosphere under pressure. Uh, so things that were normally quite fire retardant um, under normal atmosphere that uh, you and I breathe were not fire retardant under a, a pure oxygen atmosphere. And then they also got this electrical fault, which... Um, uh, just just raced through and uh, burnt everything, including them. So uh, quite a tragedy in 1967, and just uh, you know a couple of years before John Kennedy's uh, requirement to get a, a man on the moon by the end of the uh, decade. So this this was this red uh, line here, 1967. Uh, this test uh, was called a AS204, but was renamed Apollo One after the fact. So up till that point they'd had these various unmanned tests from AS-101 up to AS-202 that had tested some of the equipment out with the Saturn 1 rocket and the Saturn 1A and the 1B. Uh, the Saturn 5 would be the one that eventually took them to the moon. So that was uh, tested in 1967, uh, unmanned for Apollo 4, 5 and 6. 
And then Apollo 7 was the very first manned test. So this was the first time they brought everything together, the full Apollo stack together with astronauts and launched into uh, Earth orbit. So very successful. Uh, they managed to uh, launch this brand new rocket, untried technology at this point, uh, into orbit successfully. They did several orbits, uh, tested out some of the systems, uh, and then also tested out the re-entry back, um, back into the atmosphere and to splash down into uh, the ocean to be picked up. So, as I say, Apollo 7, the very first time this new rocket had been tried out and uh, quite successful in a few orbits around the Earth, which had been done lots of times before, uh, even by the Americans in the Mercury and Gemini projects. But, you know, if you're uh, NASA, what do you do for your next mission? You've done one successful mission with this brand new technology and uh, tried it out. So the next one, a very audacious step, they decide to go to the moon. So your second test of this brand new technology, Apollo 8, they set off for the moon. So they launch into uh, Earth orbit and then uh, fire the main booster of the third stage and off we go to the moon and they go into orbit around the moon. So these are the very first human beings to actually see the far side of the moon. So this is uh, uh, yet another step along the way of exploring the far side of the moon. So they get to see the far side of the moon and they also take this iconic photograph called Earth Rise as they come round the back of the moon and see the Earth rising above it for the first time. So uh, a very iconic picture of that time. Uh, this is the full details if you really want to see it of uh, the whole of the Apollo 8 mission. You might remember it was uh, towards the end of 1968, I believe, almost Christmas time, and they actually did some uh, readings from the Bible from the book of Genesis on their way back. It was part of the sort of Christmas celebrations that was broadcast from there. So that was uh, Apollo 8. Now we get on to Apollo 9. Now Apollo 9 was really just a check flight. So this, this stage we've got uh, the full Apollo mission and this time we'd also got the lunar lander. So the lunar lander was now ready to uh, enter mainstream testing. Uh, Apollo 8 and Apollo 7 didn't have the lunar lander as it wasn't uh, quite ready. So Apollo 9 did a, a full out check. One of the things you have to do is the Apollo 9 is actually carried uh, lower down in the Saturn V rocket. So one of the maneuvers you have to do is turn the this, uh, main command module around and go back and fetch it out of the, uh, the remains of the booster rocket. So that was something they wanted to test whether they could actually do that, because if they couldn't do that, they were uh, not really going to have a mission to the moon. So that's what Apollo 9 was all about. Uh, this wasn't a fully functional lunar module. It wasn't one capable of landing on the moon at this stage, but it was enough of a lunar module that they could test it out, check some of the systems out, and uh, especially check out the docking systems. So that was what Apollo 9 was about. Apollo 10 was the full-up dress rehearsal for this. So these are the second group of astronauts to see the far side of the moon. They took a lunar module to the uh, moon and did the full dress rehearsal. So they went into lunar orbit. They uh, transferred two of the astronauts into the lunar module and descended quite low down to the lunar surface in a full test of what could be done and also then to come back up into orbit to see if we could redock with the lunar, uh, the lunar module with the command module, which is over here on the, the right. So that's also an important step. You can get there, but you also need to get back. One thing I think was uh, quite uh, interesting was that uh, you probably know most of the Apollo astronauts were all sort of come up as test pilots. They were very gung-ho. They were used to testing uh, experimental jets and experimental fighters and experimental aircraft that had never been tested before. So they were quite gung-ho guys. So you can imagine with Apollo 10, you're getting within a few miles of the uh, lunar surface. 
why are they not going to nudge each other and say, well, why don't we just go down there and land and uh, take the glory uh, and uh, get over with and become the first men on the moon? Well, NASA were, uh, didn't want this to happen because, uh, firstly, they, they hadn't got the final version of the lunar module, but they were also careful not to provide quite enough fuel to uh, be able to do that. So they could only go down and uh, sort of visit near the fly low over the lunar surface and then return. So Apollo 11, I think everybody knows, landed safely on the moon. Uh, Armstrong and Aldrin uh, explored the moon, set up uh, experiments, some of which are still sort of working even now. And uh, they didn't, they got to see the far side of the moon as they orbited it, but uh, they landed on the near side because uh, it's so much easier to communicate with the near side. Then we skip ahead to Apollo 17, which was the last of the Apollo missions to get to the moon. Uh, Apollo 18, 19 and 20 were planned originally, but by that time budget cuts had been quite swinging and they were all cancelled. Now Apollo 17 uh, featured a geologist, Harrison Smith, and he argued strongly that they should go to the far side of the moon. They'd landed several times on the near side of the moon. We had ample evidence now that the far side of the moon was a very different structure to the near side so it would make a a good uh, candidate to go there and would be you know, a, a great hurrah for the very last mission to to go to the far side but probably uh, you know common sense or something weighed out and they returned to the near side so uh, you know, it was the last of the Apollo missions they probably uh, didn't want to risk anything else going wrong. They wanted to end on a success. So uh, uh, the Apollo 17 idea of going to the far side was a lot more risky uh, for a lot of reasons. So anyway, they, they went to the near side, successfully returned and uh, brought back some more, yet more moon rocks with them. The Apollo missions did, though, uh, start a bit of controversy that had been bubbling around for a while. The idea that the moon was hollow so it led a little bit of credence to this, that uh, perhaps the moon was just a giant alien spaceship and it was hollow and it was covered in sort of rocky stuff to just disguise it so that nobody knew any better. And part of this came from Apollo 12. Uh, so after the Apollo 12 astronauts uh, flew back from the moon's surface and redocked and they all transferred back into the command module, they threw away the uh, the lunar module because it was no more needed and was extra weight to take home and they crashed it into the moon surface as they had by now experiments on the moon surface to measure moon quakes uh, they could measure the impact of this uh, known amount of mass hitting the earth and uh, sorry the moon and causing a, a seismic uh, quake on the moon they could measure this and unfortunately they announced that uh, the moon rang like a bell for an over an hour after this um, thing hit the ground. Well, if you're a conspiracy theorist, you know that bells have to be hollow to ring. So uh, this immediately led to the idea that uh, the moon was hollow. Uh, and not a uh, particularly new idea. Edmund Halley had uh, thought that the Earth was probably hollow in back in 1692, based on uh, some calculations from Newton, which he'd actually got wrong, uh, but the only way these calculations would work out was if uh, the, moon, the Earth was hollow. But then we get to the Moon, H.G. Uh, Wells and his famous science fiction novel of 1901, The First Men in the Moon, uh, where he had a, a rocket ship, or I think it was actually a projectile, go to the Moon, and uh, the first uh, people to land on the Moon met the Moon, uh, lunar inhabitants and they were taken inside the moon to where they all lived uh, to see how they lived there. Uh, but some credence was given in 1970 by these two uh, uh, Russians who were part of the Russian Academy of Science and they wrote a popular article saying that the moon could be hollow and be a spaceship. It was published in uh, a Soviet publication which was a little more like a Reader's Digest of the time rather than a, a scientific paper. But nonetheless, the two Russian scientists had claimed that uh, the moon could be hollow and be a spaceship. And apparently this is still true today. You can buy this book, uh, if you wish, on Amazon. 
Um, I did wonder about buying it, but decided against it. Uh, who built the boon? Uh, which says, you know, the only question that remains is who built it? Very thought provoking, the Daily Mail. Read into that what you wish. Uh, it's going to say that uh, I don't believe it. And of course, uh, even today, there is you know, the idea that that's no moon, popularised by uh, Star Wars. After the Apollo missions, we really didn't do very much with the moon for a long time. Uh, we, the occasional thing passed by on the uh, way to somewhere else. But the most significant next thing to go to the moon was the LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance, Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, which was a high resolution mapping mission. So this one had uh, much more modern cameras, 2009, you know, compared to the some of the last mapping missions in the 1970s. Uh, you, you can imagine digital uh, cameras had come a long way since that point. So this made a very, very high detailed map of the moon. It has two cameras on board, one with a 100 meter resolution. So that can see objects that are about as big as a football pitch, that sort of size, and a high, um, high magnification lens that can see things that are just half a meter across. So most of the mapping is done with the 100 meter one and uh, areas of particular interest are zoomed in with the high resolution one. And you can actually see here, this is the Apollo 17 uh, landing site. You can see where it landed. You can see tracks from the buggy. Uh, you can see a uh, parking spot and even the footprints of the astronauts. So uh, you have to know where to look, obviously, because uh, you can't go around taking uh, half metre pictures of the moon all over. So uh, luckily they knew where Apollo 17 had landed, so they could go and take pictures of that. But this gives us our finest resolution pictures of the far side of the moon. And here it is in all its detail, as we can see scrolling up. So very unlike the near side, we don't get any of these big Maria that I talked about uh, earlier. Just lots and lots of craters. Now, what else is there to talk about from the far side? Well. Really recently, uh, in the last year or two, there has been a mission to the far side by the Chinese Space Agency, and this is Chang'e 4. Uh, this has uh, got a bit of uh, Chinese mythology about it, uh, which I thought I'd just introduce you to uh, have a nice wide ranging talk. So Chang'e 4 was the uh, mission there, you can see it taking off there, that uh, successfully landed on the far side. So what is Chang'e and the Magpie Bridge? So this comes from Chinese folklore, uh, which is uh, focused on some of these concepts, such as the Magpie Bridge. And they also see a rabbit in the moon. When we see a man in the moon, they have a rabbit in the moon, which you can just see there. And the rabbit in the moon uses a pestle mortar to make potions. And so the story goes, uh, back in the day, I'm not too sure when the day is, sometime early in uh, Chinese mythology, uh, there was a terrible drought over China, and this was caused by ten suns being up in the sky. And these ten suns were raining down, uh, evaporating all the water, and so there was a terrible drought. Uh, but luckily there was a famous hunter called Yi on hand, and he was tasked with going out and fixing the problem. So he went out with his bow and arrow and he shot down nine of these sons, leaving just the one son. And this fixed the problem. And uh, obviously the nation was all very grateful that uh, he had solved the uh, terrible drought that was afflicting the land. And uh, as a reward for this, he was given a potion, a potion of immortality, no less. Uh, so uh, he could drink this and become immortal. So that, that would have been great, uh, but he wasn't too sure about drinking it. So uh, he had a wife called Changi, and he thought, well, if I drink this potion, I will live forever, but uh, my wife, who I dearly love, will not live forever, so I'll get to see her die and live forever. Do I want that? And probably like a typical man, he decided he'd think about it later. So he put the potion on the shelf and uh, went off and did whatever superheroes of the day did and uh, thought he'd come back to the problem later. 
Meanwhile, his understudy, uh, Hunter Pang Meng, wasn't uh, quite so conflicted. He decided he would like to live forever, so he broke into Yi's house and went to grab the potion and uh, drink it down, swallow it. Uh, but um, uh, Chang Yi was in the house and saw him doing this, and she did the only thing she could, which was to grab the potion first and drink it down herself. So she became immortal and uh, not Yi, so, uh, but also not Pang Meng. One of the uh, issues, or one of the side effects of this, apparently, is that you then are confined to the moon. So Chang Yi was now confined to the moon. She lived forever, but she was uh, confined to live forever on the moon, uh, which was perhaps a little unfortunate. Uh, so that's uh, Chang Yi. But uh, the gods were, or whoever, were not uh, totally heartless to this. And uh, this rabbit on the moon that made these potions, uh, they decided to grant them a, a sort of uh, a way out. And so they, they built this bridge once a year between the Earth and the moon, out of magpies, naturally, that uh, connected the Earth and the moon. And uh, Chang Yi and Yi could uh, cross over the bridge and they could meet one day a year and uh, say hello or shake hands or bump elbows or whatever you do these days. Uh, and you can see there, you can see... Uh, pictures of the moon, where we see the man in the moon, they see the rabbit in the moon. So anyway, what has that all got to do with the Chinese space mission? Well, this gives us some of the uh, uh, names. So you can see there they put uh, a satellite in orbit at the L2 position on the far side of the moon. Uh, this is called Kuei Kuo, and is the Magpie Bridge. So this is the connection between the Earth and uh, the moon. So Chang'e is on the moon. Uh, this magpie bridge links the two, uh, and um, Chang'e is the uh, um, probe that landed on the moon, and it also contained uh, Yutu, which is the rabbit, uh, which is the little rover that uh, was carried on board this uh, uh, lander. So here we got some pictures of the lander, and uh, this little Yutu, the jade rabbit as it's called, that uh, trundled off the lander and then started to explore the moon. So here are a few uh, images from the Chinese Space Agency. This is the rover that had just come off. Uh, here it is trundling around. Uh, you can see it's uh, got a drill there that it can bore into the surface to take samples from underground uh, and then it can pass them through to an analysis station. Here's a little movie of it moving off and there's a picture of as looking back at the lander from uh, this jade rabbit lander. And here we have a map of all the places we've been on the moon. So you can see lots of places on the near side and just one place on the far side so far. Uh, even now, people are still unsure about uh, these conspiracy theories. So here's one from the Daily Express saying that China might have faked the dark side landing on the moon. Well, we're fairly sure they didn't because uh, here we have something from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter showing uh, pictures of Chang'e and U2 on the moon. So because we knew where they landed, we can actually see these, these pictures of them. And they've got some reasonably good scientific results. So here's a paper they published in Nature about uh, the structure of the rocks on the far side and how they are different in some ways to the near side. And it's still going. It's uh, been trundling along for a long time. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's December 2019 is when it landed. And I've certainly seen, so we've got there up to, uh, uh, we got there up to June, July. I've certainly seen uh, data from, I think, April and May this year. So it's, uh, it, it does it in fits and spurts, so you have a 14-day day and a 14-day night on the moon. So during the 14-day day, it uses its solar panels to uh, charge everything up and then go trundling around exploring, and then it goes to sleep through the 14-day night, saving itself, 
until the uh, sunlight reappears and it charges itself back up again and then does some more exploration. So very successful mission and done uh, great distances. But now it does seem it's uh, very much open season on the moon. Lots of countries are going back to the moon. So this is Chandrayaan-2 and this is an Indian uh, space agency mission. Uh, they have the lander Vikram and the rover Pragyam. This was to the near side, not to the far side. But, you know, even so, India is not renowned as a spacefaring nation, but uh, even they're getting to the moon. Unfortunately, they uh, they didn't quite make it. Well, they did make it to the moon, but uh, they didn't land softly as they wished to. They uh, uh, Things went wrong in the last uh, few manoeuvres and they ended up crashing into the moon. Uh, but uh, we also had Israel's Bereshit spacecraft. This also got to the moon, but uh, also ended up crashing. I have to say Chandrayaan-2 crashed, but uh, India is already working on Chandrayaan-3. So they're going back to the moon. So these days it's a lot easier to get to the moon. A uh, lot easier with Elon Musk's rockets and things like that to get uh, cheaper access to space all around. Uh, and here we can see some pictures of uh, the impacts from Vikram and Bereshit because uh, we also know where they landed. So just to wrap up, uh, some questions still to be answered. Uh, the, there's some uh, things we don't really know. Why is the far side so different to the near side? You can see there if you put them side by side they are quite different in structure. So that's uh, one issue. Some people wondered whether it was the Earth was protecting the near side from being hit by so many cratering objects. But if you do the calculations, the, the Earth really doesn't protect very much of the uh, the moon. As if you remember from the Earthrise picture, uh, the Earth is really quite small when viewed from the moon, so it doesn't block a lot of space debris. Uh, we do know that the uh, crust of the moon is much thicker on the far side, so that is probably why the near side has more volcanic activity from early on in its history. But then that just makes the problem one stage back. Why is the far side so much thicker than the near side? Answers on a postcard. Uh, was it a home for aliens? I think I'm fairly confident in saying it probably not, that uh, we have no evidence of any alien uh, occupying the far side of the uh, moon, despite many people wishing it so. And what are we going to do with the future? What could we do in the future? Well, for me, I think colonisation, if we're going to be a spacefaring um, uh, community, then I think colonisation of the moon is by far the easiest place to try living. I mean, we've got people living in uh, the space station, but, you know, only six or eight people at a time, usually. The moon is really the next logical step. It's only two or three days away to visit. Uh, it's uh, so, you know, if there are issues, it's only two or three days to get back or two or three days to send a resupply mission, that sort of thing. You've got to cope with a lot of the same problems, uh, which other people are considering if we go to Mars. Mars is not a lot easier to live on than the moon, really. Mars does have a very, very thin atmosphere, but nothing that will breathe or do anything uh, very constructive for you. It's not even very good for parachutes to uh, slow you down on landing. So Mars is not great, but uh, it's about a nine month trip to get to Mars and then a nine month trip back. Uh, but you do have to wait a year between those trips until Mars is close to Earth again. So um, not really so easy to get there. The other thing is, if you get to the moon and you discover there are useful things there, it's much easier to get off uh, the moon. This graph just shows you how much energy you require to get into space, basically. So the blue column is the amount of energy you need to get off the Earth into space, and the gray is what you need for the moon. So it's almost trivial to get off the moon and into space. So if you do discover, I don't know, diamonds on the moon or precious minerals or uh, rare Earths or helium-3 or any of these things that you might find on the moon, it's very easy to get them back to the Earth. You're, it's sort of downhill all the way. 
So uh, you can see you need something this big to get you off uh, the Earth. You need something only this tiny to get you off the moon. In fact, you only need half of that. Uh, and you can see the, the man in comparison. So really easy to get off the moon and get back. Uh, Mars is somewhere in between. So it's not as difficult as getting off the Earth, but uh, a little more difficult than the moon. Now, as an astronomer, telescopes on the moon would be just wonderful, uh, particularly on the far side. So this is a great use for the far side. We have struggle with uh, radio telescopes on the Earth because there's a lot of uh, radio noise, a lot of mobile phones uh, all uh, sending their signals around. So there are uh, wavelengths that you really can't use on the Earth because they're just so full of uh, other things, radio, TV, cell phones and all that. Far side of the moon is very much hidden from the Earth, so it's a great place for putting radio telescopes. It's also a great place for optical telescopes and uh, other wavelengths. Uh, because there's no atmosphere, they, they would work even better than those big telescopes on Earth. So if we ever get a, a colony on the moon, astronomers are all going to move up there, I'm pretty sure. So, uh, And I volunteer to go there. I'm, I'm quite happy to uh, go there. Uh, this was actually covered by this, this book called Earthlight uh, by R. C. Clarke. Uh, he uh, predicted this, along with many other things in in his time. Uh, this this cracking good novel actually uh, has a colony of astronomers on the moon. All nearly all astronomy is done on the moon in this in his uh, scenario. So yeah, not the first to have thought of that. So moon telescopes on the far side it would be a great idea. And in fact, there was supposed to be a discussion happening at the Royal Astronomical Society in uh, late March this year about constructing a radio telescope on the moon within a dome crater. So just uh, putting a large uh, construct remotely onto a large crater in uh, the far side of the moon. Because uh, for radio telescopes, they don't need to be particularly flat. They need to be just sort of roughly shaped because you're dealing with uh, big wavelengths. Unfortunately, as you all know, uh, that probably didn't happen because other events overtook this meeting where this was going to be discussed. So this will probably happen in the future. But anyway, far side is just great for lots of reasons. I say there's no cell phones, you don't get any clouds, there is none of this uh, Elon Musk Starlink zipping overhead every now and again. There is no atmosphere to distort the optical telescopes and there's no light pollution. So. Uh, for all these reasons, it's it's a perfect haven for astronomers. So with that, I'm coming to the end. If you've got any questions, just please type them in the uh, uh, the comments box in the YouTube, and I'll get round to answering them uh, if you have any. But otherwise, uh, if not, thank you for your uh, attention over the uh, duration of the talk. I hope it's uh, less muggy than it is here. It's really quite. Uh, quite feeling like we need a thunderstorm here, so I'm not sure what it's like over there in Melbourne, but uh, probably much the same. But anyway, with that, uh, I'd like to conclude this and thank you very much for uh, uh, inviting me back. And thank you very much for listening to it. And I hope you have uh, success in your future uh, talks that uh, go on with this uh, uh, series of remote talks until you can all get back uh, together and uh, Meet once or more and see each other once it's safe to do so. So thank you very much. I'll just hang around for a few minutes in case there are any quick questions, but uh, otherwise I'm going to finish up shortly. Right, I think we're all clear. So uh, I'm going to uh, finish up now and uh, say thank you for your attention and uh, thank you for uh, the chance to speak to you. And 
look forward perhaps to doing it uh, maybe next year when uh, we can do it in person. So with that, uh, good night and uh, hope you enjoyed the talk.